Okay, we're good. Um, hi, so my name is uh, James, James Chang, and uh, maybe a quick introduction about myself. So my, my contributions to Bitcoin have mostly been in, uh, on the project LibBitcoin. Um, so there I do documentation. I've been working my way up the, the uh, repositories and APIs. Uh, I've written examples for LibBitcoin. I think it's a fantastic developer toolkit. And um, the lead maintainer, Eric Voskel, speaking later today on Cryptonomics, um, asked me to do a uh, introduction to the toolkit tomorrow. Um, but I also volunteered to talk about HD wallets because I, I think it's a cool topic. So yeah, so HD wallets, um, there are basically three things we, I like to cover today. So the first is when we talk about Bitcoin wallets, um, you always have some kind of secret or entropy that you want to keep um, safe. And so uh, one way to store or handle it easier than just a uh, raw byte sequence is mnemonics, you know, word list. You guys have all used HD wallets. I'm sure you're familiar with that. The second part is um, you obviously want to derive new fresh keys whenever you uh, have a new transaction, right? So that's the child der derivation part. And thirdly is the um, hierarchical tree structure that you have. So we have some kind of standard way of deriving our keys, um, which really helps with recoverability of, of wallets as well. So I'll start with the first one. Um, this is captured in BIP39, mnemonic keywords. And so what we're basically doing here is we have um, some kind of entropy of, of variable length that we want to encode in words, right? Uh, so, so here we have uh, 128 bits, but you can have anything that's a multiple of 32 bits all the way up to 256. And the reason why you do that is because uh, when we encode these into words, we want to make sure that um, we can have this like checksum part. So we have a four bit checksum. It's the first four bits of the SHA-256 of the entropy that you begin with. Um, the length of the checksum depends on your entropy length, right? So when we concatenate the secret with the checksum, that has to be a, a multiple 11 bits. So all these 11 bits you see at the bottom, they ultimately map to, uh, via dictionary, they map to map to words. So right here we have, for example, which collapse, practice, ice, least. And uh, there are different languages available. You can map your entropy to um, uh, different uh, language di uh, dictionaries. So, so what we've done so far is simply we've taken, we've generated entropy, we've concatenated a checksum to make sure that if this, you know, if this word list is mistyped or you mix up the words that that can be catched. And uh, the, the resulting word list essentially encodes the, the entropy. So that's part one. Then we would like to create a, let's say, a root secret for our wallet from this word list, right? You can imagine yourself backing up um, your HG wallet from this word list. And what we do here, and it's important to note that this is not just a reverse process from before. So what we're doing here is we're taking that uh, mnemonic sentence and we're passing that through a password-based key derivation function. So that's quite a mouthful. So basically what we're doing there is um, it's, it's an HMAC function, so you have a key and a message, um, and we do that 2048 times to kind of make the brute forcing of that a little more expensive. And what we end up with is a 512-bit seed, and just so that I can make that clear, if we go back, that 512-bit seed is not the secret entropy that we began with. It is derived from that. So what you could do is you could figure out your own way of creating a word sentence, and as long as the checksum goes through, um, you know, this derivation of that 512 bits would be valid. Does that make sense? Any questions? Pretty straightforward, right? Cool. Okay, so I can actually demonstrate that in a uh, example here. So what I'm what I'm showing here is uh, this is this is a Bitcoin Explorer. Uh, Bitcoin Explorer. That's a command line tool. Um, I'll, I'll go over that in detail tomorrow. But I, what, I, what I wanted to emphasize here is just the the, the process. So we have we generate entropy, um, and we can create a word list uh, encoded from that entropy. And then from that, we can derive our 512-bit seed. So here's an example. I'm creating raw entropy of 128 bits. We can do 256. That works just great. Let me just copy this byte sequence over. And what I'm doing right now is I'm creating a new mnemonic word list um, with those 256 um, bits, right? Now I can, so here I can then create the 512 bits entropy with which I see my HD wallet. Uh, important to note, if I if I change the length of my original entropy, um, the length of my word list obviously becomes longer or shorter, right? Because it's encoding the 
the, the secret entropy one, one to one. Okay, let me go back to slides. There we go. So that, that concludes the mnemonics part. Uh, so now we have this 512 bit seed that is the, you know, that kind of seeds the entire HD wallet. And the next part of HD wallets is uh, captured in bit 32. It's around deriving child keys. Um, so I'll go into the, the details of these keys um, in the next step, but basically what we're trying to do here is we're trying to generate new keys that lead to new addresses, right? So maybe uh, I'm receiving multiple um, payments and I want these payments to go to different addresses. Obviously, if they go all go to the same address, then through chain analysis, it's pretty obvious that you know that that's 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 one person controlling. Oh, sorry, all these payments are going to one person. Um, if I can generate fresh keys, then at the very least, um, chain analysis becomes a little harder. Um, you have to infer certain wallet heuristics to to kind of group these different addresses together. So as you see here, the way the way the revision kind of works on a high level, um, you can derive via an index. So I have uh, my master keys on the top left and uh, my child keys of the subsequent generation, um, they are derived with, with, with an index of so zero, one, and two. And those, um, from those we can derive uh, grandchildren um, with, with uh, their respective indices as well. So we'll, we'll go into this a little deeper in terms of how the, the children are derived, but uh, the point of having this ability is, um, for one, I can kind of create different subtrees and every subtree, for example, could represent an account. It could represent a uh, a purpose. It could represent a uh, you know even a a a, um, a coin type or or network. And that is standardized um, in a scheme that we'll see later. But but basically, that's that's advantage of being able to create these child tree structures with um, with HD derivation. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is derive those master keys, right? So we have the 512 bits that we derived here that seeds the entire HD wallet, and now we want to generate the master keys. How do we do that? So um, generating the master keys begins, again, with the root seed. As you can see here, it's you know valid, valid entropy lines go from 128 to 512 bits. So we generated 512 before, right? So that basically means you do not have to seed it with a mnemonic um, derived uh, root seed. You can also seed it with a you know your own 128-bit um, entropy if you'd like. And we pass that root seed into uh, HMAC function, HMAC shot 512, uh, Bitcoin seed as a key, and HG, the HG root seed as the message. And out comes 512 bits. And what we do now is we split those into left and right. Um, so the left represents the master private key and the right 256 bits, they represent the master chain code. So the master chain code, as we'll see later, it's, it's an important piece of information because the, the master chain code gives you the, you know, it gives you the, in quotes, privilege to derive or the information required to derive a children later on. So obviously from the private key on the left side, we can generate the public key point simply by multiplying with the generator. Pretty straightforward, and there we have it. We have the master private key, we have the master public key, and we have this thing called the chain code that we're gonna use in a second. So that's it, that's our that's our master keys. Um, yep, okay. So then we want to derive children from these master keys. And so this scheme applies to every generation of child derivation uh, subsequently. And so we start out with the parent public key, the parent chain code, which was right here, the right 256 bits, and the child index, which we saw one step before that. So for every child, um, we use an index to derive that specific child. Uh, again, we pass that through an HMAC function. Here, the parent chain code as a key. We concatenate the parent public key and the child index to get, again, 512 bits, left and right. We split it up in left and right. The right side, again, as you, as you can see down there, that rep represents the child chain code now. The left 256, um, uh, we further add to the parent private key. And that's how we end up with the child private key. Uh, the child public key obviously is derived from that. So just to re recap, we've taken the parent pub key, the parent private key, the parent chain code, and the child index, and we've derived both private and public children key from this scheme. Does that make sense? No questions? Okay. Um, so there's there's something that we can observe here. So here we've required 
Okay. If we look at the, the keys we've we've taken to derive the children, the 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 pub the parent keys, in effect, we 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 need the the parent private key, right? Um, the parent public key on the top left, I could you know derive from the parent public private key. So as this scheme stands right now, I, I need the parent private keys to derive any children. But if I observe at the bottom left where we have um, you know in brackets the the parent private key plus left 256 bits times the generator, um, I can I can write it out like that. So what I have now is essentially the parent public key plus the point of the left 256 bits, right? And what that also what that equals is that I can essentially skip the step where I take the parent private key and derive the child public key directly from the parent publicly. Yeah? Cool. I'll go over that one more time. So this is derivation with the parent public key and parent private key. I can skip the step with the private key because if I multiply that, um, that expression out at the bottom, that essentially is essentially the parent public key uh, plus the point of the left 256 bits. Okay, so we can derive children from the parent private key, but we can also derive public children from the parent public key. Um, and to make that a little more uh, obvious, here is like the derivation path. So we have the parent keys on the left. We have the, the private key and the chain code. Obviously from the private key, I can derive the public key, but in, in terms of the children, I can now derive the private children in the arrows as you see with the coding index. And from the children private key, I can then derive obviously their, their public counterpart. And what we saw before is with a bit of uh, algebraic trickery, we can directly dire derive children public keys from the parent public keys um, as you see in the orange derivation pass right now. So that's pretty nice. So that gives us a, a certain property where we can um, create two parallel derivation paths, right? I can derive everything via the parent private key path, but I can also take a public key, extended public key, and start deriving children of that public key without actually revealing any private keys, right? So for example, if you have some front-end application where you wanted to regenerate new addresses, you can allow to do that with a extended public key um, without revealing or exposing any private key information. Okay, and then um, there's a encoding design or format for extended keys, both private and public. Um, there's one interesting thing about that where we have a parent fingerprint. So when we, whenever we look at one of these keys, one of these squares or boxes, um, they all include a, uh, a parent fingerprint, a hash 160 of the, the, the private key or the parent public key. And so that allows you to look at a child and say, okay, does this child actually belong to that parent? That's just a kind of check some ish um, verification um, um, uh, a feature. So we have the chain code in there. We have the private or public key. If it's a private key, sorry, if it's a private key, it's 32 bytes. But what we do is just, we just pad it with a, a zero byte. Uh, you have version, uh, depending on whether it's a mainnet or testnet network, or whether we're talking about extended private key or an extended public key. Right, so you have a checksum as well, and we end up with 82 bytes. So an extended private or public key is 82 bytes. Includes all the information you need to derive the respective children. There we go. So I also have a example on that. So here we go. So here we're deriving the master keys as we've shown before. We can have a quick look at the extended key serialization. Um, it starts with TPRV, PRV for private, T for testnet, because I'm using the testnet uh, version there. And from that, I can derive the um, equivalent uh, extended public key. This begins with TPUB, testnet, public key. Um, and here we can see how we would derive the, the HG children. So here's an example. I'm taking the master private key, extended private key, and I'm deriving this key right here, and, and, and through the indexing, you can see the, uh, the indexes we use for that derivation path, zero, one, and two, and there you go.
that is the respective child. Again, with the same uh, beginning T, PRV, T for testnet, um, PRV for private, private extended key. Okay. So this is pretty interesting. Um, that's all fine and good. Uh, what can happen, however, is if the parent extended publicly and the private child is exposed, namely what you see in orange right now, um, there is the possibility of deriving the parent private key. So in a sense, that's, that's kind of like an upstream key exposure. Um, we have perhaps, you know, uh, you know, you might have this front end that, that just works with the extended public key, but for some reason, a child downstream private key has been exposed. And so this is, this is what can happen. So, so we can compute L256, obviously, because we have the, um, the parent public key, the parent ch chain code, and child index, everything on the top row. We can derive the left 256 bits, and we can also derive the child chain code. Um, and if you have a look at the child private key right now, what, what's happening there is because the child private key essentially was the scalar addition of the parent private key and the left 256 bits, we can now reverse that, that operation, right? So we can now derive the parent private key by subtracting um, the left 256 bits from the child private key. And what's happened now is now the parent private key has been exposed. I uh, also have an example on that. So just to show you that uh, that actually works, and I'm not making this up. So here I've generated uh, the parent keys, right? The parent private key, the parent public key, the parent chain code, and the child private key. And let's assume this cell here is, let's say, the, the attacker or the malicious actor, and he has obtained the extended parent public key, which is this these two guys, right here and here. And he or she has also obtained the child private key, which is this factor right here. And what I want to do is I want to then compute the parent uh, private key from that information. Let's see if we can make that happen. So the computed private key is, starts with 4C6AD, um, which, is, which is exactly that. So I've linked the examples in the Slack. You, can guide, you guys have a closer look um, how that works. But it essentially follows the exact scheme I just described right here. So to prevent this from happening, oh, okay. So let's have a look at how that would um, affect our uh, our HD tree. So we have the extended public keys, the, the parent public keys in orange on the left side are exposed. There is a private key, child private key that is exposed. And the chain codes of both private and public key are the same, of the same index, right? Same for the children. There we go, and then we can derive the parent public key. So, so what's happened now is the, the parent private key has been derived, and subsequently all the children downstream can be derived from that. So imagine, imagine the top left were, let's say, the master keys, right? If the master keys are exposed in that way, then obviously my entire wallet um, has just been exposed, so that's, that's really bad. Uh, fortunately, there's, there's a way to, to limit that and uh, we do that via hardened HD children. Okay, so, so what we have here is the same derivation schematic we saw before. This is how you would derive a non-hardened child, right? So we have uh, pub key, parent chain code, child index, parent private key, and so on and so forth. So we're gonna change that a little bit. Have a look at the top left where we have the parent pub key. I'm gonna change that pub key to a private key. Now it's highlighted in orange. Um, what's fed into the HMAC is slightly altered. We, we, have a, we concatenate the message with a, another zero byte. And let's have a look at how that affects the, the factors downstream, downstream. So obviously the left 256 bits change. I've denoted that prime. The right 256 bits, which is the child chain code, are altered. And essentially the child private key and the child public key are now hardened keys, hardened children keys, right? We, we refer to those as hardened keys. Um, and so, so how does this help? Well, let's have a look at how the derivation looked like before. So I'm switching back to the original derivation on the top, and at the bottom we have the, the hardened children pub, pub keys. So here you can see how they are no longer the same. It is no longer possible 
to derive a child puppy, a hardened child puppy, directly from the parent puppy. That is no longer possible. So we've broken that derivation path. It used to be possible to do that, right? I take a extended uh, puppy, and I could just derive all the children from that. That has been broken with this, this schematic. The same goes for the right 256 bits. That has been altered um, with the scheme here. Any questions? OK. So we can have a look at the effect on the, um, on the derivation tree. What is in dotted orange, that was the parent pub key to child pub key derivation path that we had before. That is now broken. We've, we've, we've broken that with the hardened keys. And you can see in the um, children keys, that's noted with this like prime symbol, right? OK, so I have, an, I have an example for that as well, which I can show. So here we're trying to arrive um, hardened key, index 44. And so this is, the, this is the important part. So here I'm trying to derive a child pub key from a hardened parent pub key, right? Both denoted with prime. So I'm trying to derive a, um, a child pub key, a hardened child pub key from a hardened parent pub key. And that's not possible because we broke that derivation path with this scheme, right? Okay. Okay, so finally, there is a, um, a, a standardization in terms of the, the derivation hierarchy uh, captured in bit 44, I think 43 as well. And so what that basically says is um, when, you, when you derive your keys for use in the HD wallet, there's a certain scheme that you adhere to. Um, 44 prime just refers to the, for the BIP. Um, zero, uh, here, the second index here refers to whether it's mainnet or testnet. Uh, the third one refers to the account number. So that could be, um, you know, you might generate multiple accounts for your for a wallet. Number four refers to whether it's a receiving address or a change address. So if it's number one, that means um, that the, the, the address is one which you're basically sending money to yourself, right? And number five is the nth uh, address that you're deriving, either receiving or or change address. Okay, so this is this is obviously a nice standardization. One thing that it really helps out with is HD wallet restoration. So so everything we've talked about is kind of recapped here, right? So we have the mnemonic word list and the optional passphrase from which we derive our our master keys. We have the different accounts here, right? First testnet account, second testnet account, third testnet account. And let's assume you've lost your hardware wallet and you only have that pass, or you only have your mnemonic word list and the optional passphrase that you've backed up. So every wallet um, obviously has a, you know, a unique usage pattern in that sense. There, I may, I, you know, like the, the tree that is derived uh, in, your, in your wallet will look different depending on how you use it. Some address, for, for every new um, receiving transaction, I'm gonna generate a new, um, new receiving address. For every send transaction, most likely, I'll generate a new change address. So how do I know when I'm restoring from, from scratch, how do I know which addresses um, I, should, I should drive up to, right? And the way that works is you basically just, you know, you check whether these addresses have been used or on, on the blockchain. And if they are unused, you just iterate through the indices. And if they are unused, you, you kind of tolerate a gap up to 20 unused addresses. And then after 20, you stop searching. You say, look, the prob you know, I've, I've restored the address. Um, I found a gap of 20 unused addresses. Likely, the user of that wallet never generated more than those. So to, to make that specific, uh, we have one more example here as well. So here I'm taking a uh, mnemonic that is in quotes backed up, and I am generating uh, the children that we saw before, and I want to see which one have been have, have been used and which ones have been not have have not been used. And so what's this basically what it is doing now is generating these addresses, and it is querying the the server. Um, in terms of whether they've been used or not, right? So this one has been used, this one has been used, the third one has been used. So perhaps the user generated an address but never received funds on it, that could be possible. Um, but then this one was used again. 
and after a gap of 20 has been discovered, uh, it stops the search. So that's essentially how a HD wallet is then recovered from the mnemonic. Um, and obviously the, the, the standardization of this hierarchy helps a lot with that. Okay, so the, that covers uh, the chapters. Those are the three things, mnemonic word lists, uh, child derivation, and uh, standardization of, of the, of the um, derivation hierarchy. Yeah, uh, do you guys have any questions? Be happy to try and answer. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm uh, Jonathan Underwood with BitBank, and uh, I also work on Bitcoin JS Lib. And one thing that we've found many, many times with the issues that we get from developers on our on our repositories is that I think the whole BIP 39, BIP 32, BIP 44 combination. A lot of people feel like this solved yeah. wallet UX, but I feel like it really doesn't. Um, and I think this can also be seen by, like, for instance, LND recently um, invented a new AZ uh, kind of drop-in replacement for BIP39. Um, also, there's other uh, proposals like BIP47 payment codes, which is kind of increasing the privacy aspects of kind of like what BIP32 couldn't really do um, because everyone wants to exchange XPUBs instead of addresses, but then, oh wait, there's that whole, you can recover the child, uh, the parent private key, so you don't want to exchange XPUBs. So then, you, you know, there's a bunch of different uh, UX problems, I think, in the way. So what are your thoughts, um, at, you know, running LibBitcoin and what developers have told you and users of, uh, of the wallets that are based on your repository? What are your thoughts on how this can be improved? And I know that's a really, really big wide area. So I think what's the number one thing that you think could be improved upon this whole HD uh, scheme that you've explained today? Uh, unfortunately, I'm not the person to answer that question. I, I, I don't have that, the, the vast experience with, with actual production wallets that, that you would need to. Um, so sorry, I, I don't think I'm in a position to, to answer that question. Okay, thank you. I, I don't know. for change addresses and so forth, but rather using the non-hardened pub keys for receiving addresses? Is that sort of the best practice at now? Um, so if you look at, uh, I think it's BIP44, um, the, uh, you know, the, the hardened indices are up to the accounts, and then and then after that, um, they are no longer hardened. So in the worst case, the account you know, parent keys, if you would, would never be exposed or in the in the fashion that that I described earlier. So, so in that sense, the, the the parent keys in the accounts, at the very least, are are protected or at least hardened. Right. So, so, yeah. so my understanding is, if you wanted the ability for someone to be able to send funds to your address without knowing before, without being given the address beforehand, then you can use an unhardened um, pub key. Yep. Right. And so you would use that for a class of transactions where you know basically you, have, you use it for deposit addresses, for example. Yeah, absolutely, right? absolutely. Unhardened. But you would only use it for deposit addresses. Or change addresses, yeah. Change addresses as well? Yes, yes. Okay. Oh. Yes. Okay, all right, thanks. Yeah. So that's the, the zero and one, for zero for receiving and then one for, for uh, change addresses. Yeah. Okay, thanks guys.